And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining our platform today across the great Louisiana Plain, where we are elevating the cause of constitutional conservatism daily, advancing the cause and vision of constitutional conservatives and slowly but surely draining the Louisiana swamp. My name is Chris. And I'm Danielle. And this is the State of Freedom, brought to you by freedom-loving Louisiana First Patriots. Hello, State of Freedom Warriors. Thank you for inviting us to be part of your day. We are so grateful for you. You are the best listening family anybody could possibly hope for. And we are only here because of your encouragement, your prayers, and your financial support. If you are looking for a way to support us, to advertise with us, or to send us feedback, please visit our website at freedomstate.us. We would really, really appreciate it if you would help us get the word out and spread the reach of the state of freedom. Please like the show on whatever platform you listen to us, subscribe and share it. You can even share short clips rather than full episodes from our YouTube and Rumble channels. And the links to those, as always, are in the show notes and over on freedomstate.us. Today, we'll be taking a look at the outcomes of this election cycle for the Senate, With a Marine veteran who is a true Louisiana first fighter and a patriot, we are absolutely thrilled to have State Senator Caleb Klein-Peter joining us today. Before we talk to Caleb, let's take a look at the scripture of the day. It's Psalm 100, and it says, Lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it, everyone, everywhere. Worship Yahweh with gladness. Sing your way into His presence with joy and realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping Yahweh our God, for He is our Creator and we belong to Him. We are the people of His pleasure. You can pass through His open gates with a password of praise. Come right into His presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offering to Him and affectionately bless His beautiful name. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you. And he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. I just love that. I was reading it this morning, and I just think Psalm 100 tells us that it's our thanksgiving that opens the gates of the Lord's presence for us. It's thanksgiving that puts our hearts in the right posture for worship, and it's thanksgiving that builds our faith because it reminds us that the Lord has come through for us and will continue to be faithful to come through for us. He never lies. He never leaves us. He never fails, and He never loses. He is the faithful, everlasting God who loves us more than we can even fathom. So much so that he sent his only son, Jesus, to earth to become an example for us in how to live and to be the perfect sacrifice to put us back in right relationship with God. He endured the pain and torment of the cross and the weight of our sin so that we could be restored to righteousness. And our right response is to be honest before Him, to thank Him, to turn from our former ways, and to invite Him to be the one who leads us and our lives. His love made a way for us before we needed a way, and we have every reason to be continually thankful. What a great scripture for Thanksgiving. You know, the foundation, as you said, and as Psalm 100, Danielle says so well, the foundation of everything we do is a heart of gratitude for his how loving God is, how kind he is, how faithful he is. And boy, we have so much for which to be thankful. And one of the things and people for whom I'm very, very thankful is our guest, as you said today, Senator Caleb Klein-Peter, who has been such a force in the state Senate uh, in only the short period of time that he's been there. What a privilege to have you with us today, Senator Klein-Peter. How are you, sir? Good morning, Chris. How are you? Oh man, I couldn't couldn't be better. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Yep, happy Thanksgiving to you and Danielle. Uh, yeah, great scripture. Sometimes I, I question. You know, you're supposed to be thankful, but I, I wonder what God, uh, <laughs> what reason has He put me in this position? Sometimes it's uh, it can be tough. It can be uh, grueling. It takes a lot of time away from the family, but it, it is a good scripture. I, I told my uncle that he ran for a parish council seat in Iberville Parish and great godly man that uh, he in the primary he was at 49 point something percent we thought for sure he was just going to slam dunk it and uh, he lost 55 to 45 and I told him I said you know the door 
that you thought were gonna, was going to be open um, didn't open and that it's it's staying closed for a reason and you know you might not know what that reason is at this at this moment but it goes to all the candidates that ran you know in this past election that you know if they're listening if anybody else is listening that just don't be down be thankful that for some reason that door didn't open Exactly. And, and, you know, you make such a good point, uh, Caleb, that sometimes the results or the answers are not what we had expected or not what we hoped for. But to be thankful, even in those moments, knowing, as you said, that another door, that's just because God has another plan and another door, because his ways are perfect, far beyond our ways. It's interesting you say that sometimes you wonder... (laughs) <laughs> Why God put, 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 put you in the position that you're in, because believe me, I know how grueling it is. And I know how hard you in particular work to faithfully represent your constituents. And sometimes it's a thankless task. But thank you for all, all you do for us. Oh, you're welcome. I tell that to everybody. I say, you know, I have nine parishes. That's nine parish presidents nine sheriffs, uh, 26 municipalities. That's 26 mayors and, and uh, police chiefs. That's a lot. A lot of people depend on you, depend on you and look up, look up to you. Yep. They'll reach out for anything and everything. And that's what I promised them. I promised them that I would, I would work very hard for them. And if I didn't answer their phone call that I would, I would call them back and people are just blown away when I answer the phone. And they're like, is this a senator? I'm like, yes, it is. We thought we were calling your office. And I'm like, no, nope. I, I ran on this. So uh, it's very rewarding when I do hear things like that, that they're shocked. Yeah, shocked, shocked in in all the good ways. Speaking, Caleb, of of good people like you being elected to office and hopefully getting other good people in office, I wanted to ask you what what is your opinion of what we call the jungle primary election system in Louisiana, whereby anybody from any party they throw them all in together, they all run in a primary, and whichever two emerge in the runoff go in for a general election. What is your view of that system, and do you have any plans uh, to try to, to do something about that system? Look, I do not like that system at all. I think that if, if you're a true Republican or a true Democrat, anybody that is true to their party would like a closed primary. We saw it four years ago and eight years ago that, that the uh, Republicans beat each other up and, and John Bell walked right on in there. And then on the uh, reelection, he, they, we did the same thing. And uh, I do have plans. I just spoke with my, one of our attorneys at the Capitol and I asked her to, to pull it if we had a previous bill from years ago. And I'm going to pre-file a bill. Hopefully we get some other senators on board so we can have closed primaries to where we can put true Republicans on the ballot. And if there's somebody that just switches just because the district changed, then uh, your Republicans will vote the Republican they want in there. And your point that it, we're dealing with a you know a true Democrat or a true Republican, someone who really is philosophically aligned with the principles of their party, why would they object to a closed primary system? You know, you you would think that that everybody would be in favor of it. What about uh, the election system in general, Caleb? The, for particularly the, the mail-in absentee ballot and some of the ballot harvesting that we see in Louisiana. What are your thoughts on that and how that affects uh, our system? It's frustrating, Chris. There, there was, in my last election, my opponent had on his campaign report, look, this is all public knowledge. This is all public records. Anybody can go to the ethics board and, and search on the website and get it for their own information. That was uh, people were paid to go collect absentee ballots and mail-in ballots and uh, go drop them off. And it's hard to compete with that when you have integrity and you want to get in there for the right reasons and not have to look over your shoulder. It's, it's hard. It's very frustrating that people are allowed to go pick up 20, 30, 40, 50 ballots and go drop them out off at the post office. And when people question me on that, what I want to tell them is go put $500 in an envelope and go mail it cash. Can you tell me if you trust the mail system? This is a ballot to elect people to positions, and it's a chain of custody. You know, uh, I, I think that, you know, the elderly or the, the people that just become, I guess, desperate to get their mail-in ballot, they don't want to put it in the in the mail system, and they trust anybody that comes up to, to pick it up from them. And we don't know what happens with that ballot. Does it get turned in? Does it get changed? Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answers for that, but... I think the chain of custody is the biggest thing. And look, if, if somebody's disabled, I want 
look, like, like you said, I fought for this country. I want everyone. I would, I don't care if they vote against me or me or whatever. I want everyone to have the opportunity to go vote. If you're disabled and you can't go vote, then I think that, do I trust the mail system? No, but I do trust that if somebody is related to them or a friend and they pick up that mail-in ballot, they should have the opportunity to go to the uh, Register of Voters Office, which is something that they should be able to trust, turn it in and scan their license. That way that there's there's only so many mail-in ballots that you can bring. You don't have these, yeah. These, yeah. these mules that are picking up hundreds of mail-in ballots and going to drop them off at a post office. And we exactly. don't even know what's going on with yeah. them. That's a great point. Especially when after what the 2020 election, we saw 100% turnout at some nursing homes, which, you know, there's only one answer for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you have video of, of the same person that was on that campaign report going drop off mail-in ballots at the post office, it's clear that the person that was picking up mail-in ballots the year before are picking up mail-in ballots and getting paid for them. And it's on the campaign report this year. Uh, it's, it's frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Yeah. And, the cha- you know, it's interesting, Caleb, that it's bad enough when you when you have no chain of custody. OK, uh, but what, what happens to all these ballots from the moment they're picked up from whoever they're getting them from to the time they get to the voter registration office, to the precinct, wherever they're wherever they're going? What happens to them? How do we know that they're not changed? How do we know that they're authentic? That in and of itself, the chain of custody, as you said, is a real concern. But you throw in the money incentive. When you have a campaign that's paying thousands and thousands of dollars to individuals to do this work, I mean, they're essentially out there working for the campaign, which creates uh, an even greater incentive to manipulate the ballots, to change something. And of course, we're not suggesting that that has occurred, but the incentive is certainly there, especially when you're talking about the kind of money just in this election that your opponent spent on on canvassing, $20,000 to pay people to go pick up ballots? Yep. That's just in the New Roads area and and very little bit of and that was in the last 30 days that was on the 10 day report so no telling what was spent in the last 10 days and on election day you know in years ago this was not recorded years ago this stuff was done by cash money that was come that came down from way higher ups and and what they call as uh, suitcase money i'm new to all of this you know i, I didn't get into the state level until last year but i my eyes have just been open and i've talked with congratulations with with all our statewide Liz and and Liz Muro, our attorney general, but specifically Nancy. I've been in touch with Nancy quite a bit on this, on all of this. And uh, we found some loopholes here in the last, her and I and and Kyle have talked in the last 30 days a lot. And um, I plan on bringing some bills, uh, election integrity bills to try to strengthen this even more. So it's good to know that Nancy got elected and good to know that she is willing to work with me and uh, see where we can tighten this up a little bit more. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And I have to wonder, is it just the arrogance and that that is causing this stuff to get reported on the campaign reports rather than just straight cash? Or, or do you think that cash payments are happening too? I mean, that's what it looks like to me. Yes, cash cash is definitely still happening. It was reported on uh, Saturday that it was happening back of town. But as far as the arrogance to actually put canvassing and mail-in and absentee ballots on a campaign report is just downright dis- disgusting to me. I think it takes away the uh, the integrity. I mean, when you start looking at the makeup of, of a little small municipality like Maringwin and the demographics of it, and you had a, a uh, Democrat, Republican, Republican, and uh, the Republican gets, the true Republican got seven, I think she got the same around what I got last, last year in Maringwin, 70 something votes. And she got 70-something votes in the primary and then 70-something votes in the, in the runoff. Why would the other Republican that received 280 votes in the primary all of a sudden go up to 400 votes in the runoff when there's no Democrat in the race at all? Yeah, especially when there's – it's a, it's a people were not particularly motivated in large part to vote in this runoff election to start with. So there, it, it begs the question that something was motivating them. Yeah. Yes. There's no question about it. And it's interesting. Maringwin is in Point Capi Parish, right, Caleb? No, it's in Everville. Oh, it's in Everville Parish. Okay. Well, so the opponent, Lacombe, gets 84% of the vote in Everville, 
382 to 74, where some of these shenanigans were going on, 382 votes to 74. It's interesting that that, uh, Tammy beat him soundly in West Feliciana, beat him soundly in in, uh, West Baton Rouge, and Lacombe beats her two to one in Point Capie, where most of the votes were cast. And then in the few votes that were cast in Iberville, he beat her 84%. So it looks like it was one, quote unquote, one in Point Capie and uh, in Iberville. Yes. Yep. Yeah. When you get over 50 percent of the district in Point Capi and Iberville to go vote and, and he beats her 65 percent, numbers are numbers and they don't lie. Yep. And we know that you were a vocal supporter of Tammy in, in her race against Jeremy Lacombe, who who I think we mentioned earlier, but who you beat handily in your Senate primary race. What is your take on the outcome of that race. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, we believe that there were some shenanigans that were happening behind the scenes, but is the reported outcome final in your view based on some of your conversations with Nancy Landry and Kyle Ardwent? Or do you think that there's some, is there some mechanism for overturning it if there were, if there were bad actions that were taking place? That the, the famous line, I can't um, confirm nor deny if there's an investigation. <laughs> Uh, if that's what you're asking. But look, I think the race is final. You know, I mean, at 1,300, I think he won by 1,300 votes. Just over. Yeah, just over. It, it's, it's over. You know, if it was 10, 20, 30, 40 votes, something like that, possibly you could you could contest uh, signatures on, on mail-in ballots and, and possibly throw things out. But as far as contesting it, I think it, it's over. Look, he won it. It is what it is. It's just frustrating, very, very frustrating. I, I had no ambition to run for Senate. I was approached to run. I wanted to know why, and it was because of a particular person that was going to run. I studied his voting record. And one thing I will never do, I will never attack a man or a woman's character. I will never talk about his or her uh, wife, husband, family, anything like that. But I just do not align with his voting record. I do not. Uh, I've studied, I, before I decided to run, I studied it to a T. And there are a lot of votes that people just don't talk about that are not brought up, votes that died in, in committee. And they, a lot of people don't know the, the process of how a bill works. And, uh, you know, there were bills this year that I killed in Senate and governmental affairs that, that was voted on. And I just didn't, I could not believe that they even ar- arrived at the Senate. And we, you know, the Senate pretty much decides and uh, we killed it in committee. That way we wouldn't vote on it on, on the Senate floor. But it's frustrating that whenever you put all of this out there and, um, you know, Tammy gets the brunt of it on some people. You know, it was fake news. Fake news is all they kept on saying and how she's slinging mud and, you know, the, the Freedom Caucus and the LCCMs and the, the everything that was for Tammy that they were putting out fake news. It's not fake news. It's a voting record. It is a simple voting record. Go read the bill and you decide how you, you know, and I had to educate a lot of people, but um, it's, it's just mind boggling to me that people would go from, you know, voting what 47% last year against him to electing him in in point compete. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the point I was going to, that's the point I was going to make simply is that I just find it very, very interesting and and quite suspicious actually that you would run against him and in his home parish of point compete in 2022, close to 50% of everybody who voted in point compete voted for somebody besides him. And yet, now in this election, he gets up to, you know, 64% of the vote in the same parish. It's just quite, quite interesting and noteworthy to me. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I've seen this election cycle is that people who are confronted with the truth of their own actions like to call it mudslinging. I'm like, that is not mudslinging. That is the truth. Those are the facts. If you don't want to face them, you should have done something different at the time. You can you can say that you would have preferred if you had behaved differently. But the facts are the facts. Right. Yeah. But, you know, you're right, uh, Caleb, because we, we've studied his his voting record very, very closely as well. Just surprising. Uh, it's, it's hard to see, actually, a voting record that is more misaligned or inconsistent with the basic values of, of the citizens down there than his voting record is. I can't think of any other representative right off the top of my head. And we've studied a lot of voting records. So, um, you know. The easiest way to do it is if in, in the, the biggest, most important votes are always tracked by lobby and by Louisiana Family Forum. And when you pull scores for, for you know, those that are elected and you see a 33% and a 36% and a 
that does not represent what District 18 in the House and District 17 represent. This is a conservative district, and uh, those scores are just horrible. Now, I, look, I wish him nothing but the best. He won. He's one of my state representatives that I have to work with. Uh, I will gladly work with him because if I don't, all it will do is hurt, you know, our district, and that's not what I want. You know, I guess we'll we'll, we'll put differences aside and uh, see what we can do as far as to, to best grow our district. But uh, I will be watching. Yeah, as will we very, very closely. LeCag and, and the State of Freedom will be watching very closely, and he will absolutely be on our radar screen. Going forward, Caleb, to the new Senate, uh, we've had some, and Danielle and I on our show and LeCag, you know, got involved in a, a number of these races, and we're very delighted to see uh, some of the new folks who will be your colleagues in the State Senate. Talk to us about the makeup of the new state senate and uh how that looks and what you're uh looking at as far as priorities going forward oh gosh i'll tell you a little story real quick um you know i got elected last november and we went into this special session last year for insurance and stephen Wagesback, who was uh over lobby he uh he really coached uh the senate a good bit and uh I, I, we had a little seminar during that during that special session and uh, it was probably, oh gosh, probably 15 senators um, that were in there. And he was talking about it. And he said, now here we got, you know, newly elected Senator Caleb Klompeter that's just sitting here going, duh. And he said, Caleb, you don't understand the oil painting that is that is being painted right now that's finally being painted. You're going to be, you're, you're here for one year in this, in this process. And then everything is going to align and you're going to reap the benefits from it. And I'm excited, man. I really am that I had the opportunity to serve under, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but to serve under John Bell and uh, Paige Cortez and others, and now to see what's going to happen. And it's just amazing to to know what's possibly going to happen. If, if it doesn't happen, shame on me, shame on Governor-elect uh, Landry and all of us in office. But, um, you know, the new makeup, look, I have... I'm a people person. I would walk around the Senate and have relationships with everyone. I enjoy it up there. I love making, forming better relationships with everyone. You know, it's sad to see some of them go. You know, I only got to serve under one year, uh, you know, some of them voluntarily and some of them walking away. You know, uh, some of them didn't particularly vote like I would, but they're all amazing people. Uh, Louis Bernard, I, I hate to see him go on some aspects, but just him and I were really good. We had a good friendship. Bass, I spoke with Bass coming in. Uh, I think him and I are going to get along uh, very well. Uh, Robert Ally, I helped Robert out big time down. He took over my assumption in Lower St. Martin District, and uh, he won pretty good uh, on Saturday. And look, uh, the ones that are coming over from the house is just going to just, it's really uh, amazing, you know, uh, for Allen and, and Blake and oh, Valerie to come over because it's just going to strengthen us even more. So I had a relationship with them whenever they were on the house side, people would make fun of me because I would go over on the house and, and watch the, the circus over there. And uh, they're like, what are you doing over here? You don't belong. And it just, you know, I, I never really watched the Senate. I would always watch the house and uh, to be part of the Senate. And it, I would go over there just to remind me how blessed I have it, but also to keep watch <laughs> on things. But, uh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm really am glad as far as with uh, the makeup of the Senate and then with, with the governor coming in there. And uh, look, Cameron's a great guy. Cameron's, uh, it was between him and Mike and they're great, both people. I think we would have been in good hands no matter what. They worked it out between them too, which I'm glad. But Cameron's going to lead us. You're talking about uh, the Senate president. Senate yeah, president. Senate president. Yeah, Senate president's going to be Cameron Henry. And uh, between him and, and Mike and Sharon and Beth, they were the four that just pretty much helped me out every step of the way on anything that I needed. They were there. They were reachable. And I think it was genuine between him and Mike whenever they reached Mike out to me and said, Facey? Mike Reese. No, Mike Reese. Mike, Mike Reese. Reese. Mike Reese was going to run for Senate president as well. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm glad that they worked it out between them. We don't want to get caught in between that because it's relationships. Yeah. It is what it comes down to, you know, and, and um, you know, you're, you you make a point about having real 
real conservatives like Alan Seaball, Blake Miguez, Valerie Hodges going it, going into the Senate. You know, I, I've said it more than one time on our show uh, that the Senate appears to it appears to us, and it's been told to us by by other state reps. It looks like the chamber, at least traditionally, where good legislation often goes to die. Uh, and hopefully that culture will change with the help of people like you and many of these new conservatives who are going in there over from the House. Because I can tell you, we worked very, very hard in some of these races. I know the candidates themselves worked very hard and, and many people worked very hard to get them elected precisely in order to change the culture over in the Senate. And so hopefully that will happen. And we're certainly going to be uh, pushing as hard as we can to make sure that that happens. Yeah, it was frustrating to me. And like I said, I'm, I'm new. I, I still somewhat consider myself a freshman, even though I have, what, three under my belt now. I have an insurance session, a regular session, and a veto override, which I'm so proud to say that we actually overrode him for, what, the second time, and I was a part of it. So um, when Cameron sat me down and said, hey, what, what committees do you want? And I told him, I said, I, I don't care. Put me where we need to lead this state. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to stay on Jude, see if he wants me to. I told him I don't think anybody will fight me on it, but that's going to be a hot committee with crime. I believe that we're going to pass some bills, some really good bills. I want to get tougher on crime. I want to look at some things and work with uh, the attorney general and, and, and Jeff and see where we need to go to change this state because crime is just out of control. You know, Senate and Governmental Affairs is another committee I'm on. That'll be a hot topic with redistricting. And then Natural Resources is, a, is always an interesting committee. So, um it doesn't matter to me. I told him all I don't I, I don't want to be put on education, but hey, if I get put on education, it'll it'll happen. But it's uh it's gonna be interesting over the next four to eight years what happens with Louisiana. It will. And you you mentioned a special session on insurance that you've participated in. There's do you think the likelihood of that happening pretty early on in, in this new legislature will will happen probably in the January time frame? Yes. Well we have that January 15th deadline, and I have not looked up to see if it has been extended for redistricting to draw the map. You know, uh, it's not like I can't comment on anything. I just, I think there's a lot of unknowns right now, but but we don't have the time to be able to go in, you know, with the governor getting sworn in, I think on the 8th or the 9th, uh, he can't call a session for seven days, and that's just not enough time to draw the map. The, the judge would have to, to grant an extension on that, and then we have to go from there. But yes, I do anticipate that we'll have Uh, a special session in January, I would think, and then uh, probably one right before session, another one. Do you think there'll be a special session on crime, given given how serious the issue is across the state? Possibly. You know, there's, uh, we had, uh, speaking of crime, Danielle, you make a, so glad you brought that up. Caleb, we had uh, Lieutenant Nungesser on our show very, very recently, and he mentioned that uh, the the crime, well, really throughout the state, but uh, particularly, you know, in New Orleans, uh, is so bad at this point that uh, there there is real question about whether or not the city has the, the law enforcement infrastructure to be able to safely host the Super Bowl, which uh, they're they're scheduled to do. It it is that bad with businesses closing, uh, particularly in the French Quarter, and just the crime being out of control. And of course, it's not it's not limited to New Orleans. It's all over the state uh, in various places. So it's, it's good to hear that that is a priority for you in the next session. Yeah, it's, it's a huge priority for me. Uh, the juvenile crime is out of control. And, you know, I'm, I'm working with Tony Clayton. He's one of my, my district attorneys over here in the um, 18th JDC. And he knows that it's a serious issue. You know, the governor-elect put him on the transition team as well. And uh, Tony's tough on crime. I believe that these young juveniles are, are doing adult crimes and they're not being held accountable because they know that they, they just they're not going to be held accountable. And it's uh, it's frustrating. So um, I'm willing to work with Tony and the rest of the DAs and the Sheriff's Association to uh, see what we can do to, to drive this crime problem down. I don't know if it's more law enforcement or, or stricter penalties or, or what, but ankle monitors are not are not working when you have these kids. You have some of them. I think we had one in Point Capi that attempted murder or committed murder or something. They had ankle bracelets, two ankle bracelets on, and one of them had an ankle wrist uh, on and attempted attempted another murder. And uh, and we could, we couldn't lock them up. You know, we have some. Of, I talked to um, oh down in Bridge City, and the woman told me that Alabama and all these other states 
will not take Louisiana teens anymore because they're the they're the most ruthless juveniles in the country. They cause problems in the jails. They tear stuff up. They create they create riots. And um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a culture. I don't know if it's a home up home bringing. I don't know. I, I really don't. But we have to do something. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you uh, part of the problem or a significant part of the problem is uh, the, the absence of paternal authority figures in the lives, yeah. in, in, in the lives of, of these young boys and young men. I mean, basically, they're being raised by, by a rap culture and in many cases by, by a government. Uh, that, uh, and so there's no question that the absence of, uh, of father figures in their lives is, is very, very sad and a, a key element involved in this. No question about that. That has to, to change. It is a cultural issue. No, no question. Do you, uh, Caleb, foresee... Uh, at this point, having it looks to us just surveying the field based on the real successes that we had this cycle in both on both the House side and on the Senate side, uh, it looks like we have uh, the complexion at this point in both chambers to get some real things done here. And so, let me ask you this: Do you do you have any reason? why we will not be able to accomplish some really significant things in the next session. No, that's why I'm, I'm very excited, I, you know, to have a new speaker of the house and a new uh, Senate president and a new government governor and to have what 28 in the Senate, and I think with 73 in the house, I, like I said earlier, shame on us. If we don't turn this state around and become a Mississippi who is just, we're, we're dead last with us. And now they were on their third Republican governor and uh, just making leaps and bounds uh, on on ranking levels within the country. Yep. And do you think there's uh, the the will within the Senate to take another look at our state constitution as well while we have such a strong makeup? Yeah, I, th- I think we should. I think we should be able to look at a lot of things and determine and, uh, on what needs to happen for Louisiana. You know, there's, look, again, I go back to our, our, our Senate president. Cameron was in the House for 12 years and, and uh, on appropriations over there and, and in the Senate for, for four years now. Cameron knows a lot as far as on the money. You know, he uh, he knows what we can do and what we can't do. And uh, we're going to kind of lead on him a good bit. He's he, Cameron is super conservative and he has a vision as far as what we need to do for our state. And um, I think that we can trust him. I don't think I know we can trust him. We just have to. Um, we have to put a plan together and move forward. Can we take, uh, you know, I think that we're eating on, we're going to be eating on an, on an elephant and you can't eat it all at once. It's going to be one bite at a time and it's just going to take a, it's going to be a little process in it. So. Yeah. Well, we are looking forward very much to watching and assisting and to, to seeing you at the session. And and ultimately, Senator Klein, Peter, uh, w- we know that you recognize and appreciate the grassroots organizations that, that, that help you and others to hold some of these officials accountable for staying faithful to what they ran on. Uh, one of the big laments that, that citizens across the state have is that so many people run on a, a certain agenda, on a certain platform platform that sounds good and that is constitutional and conservative. And they get there and they they become virtually unrecognizable uh, in a short period of time because they just, uh, for whatever reason, they either become corrupted or begin to engage in, in self-enrichment. But we intend to, to hold people accountable, as you do, to make sure that they are faithful to their representations. And if we do that and we all work together, uh, we agree with you. We can really, really, really make some huge changes changes in Louisiana that are desperately needed. And we know you'll be at the tip of the spear on all of that because of uh, the person that, that you are and the character that you have. So thank you so very, very much for joining us today and for your leadership and service in our state. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to it. You know, I look forward to working with you all and everyone else and uh, moving this state forward. I'm, I'm tired of being dead last. There's no reason why we can't be um, in the top with every all the resources that we have here in Louisiana. There's no no reason at all. So if there's anything that I can do for you all, please let me know and uh, stay in touch. Perfect. We look forward to it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Y'all have a great one. You too. God bless.
Chris, I think he's really going to drive some things through. It sounds like he's, I mean, and and we knew it already, right? He's a guy with a lot of great relationships. He's got a personality and a warmth to him that that draws people in, and, and he's able to make those connections across issues across party lines. Uh, it's uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of statesman we we need. But he also sees things very clearly and is not going to compromise on his values. He's not going to compromise on his position, but he can have a, a reasonable conversation with someone who may see things very differently. And that's what it's going to take. Uh, someone who has strong convictions, but someone who also has the ability to dialogue and, and reason with people. Uh, I'm particularly gratified that, that he wants to tackle uh, some of the issues on election integrity that we talked about today, some of this ballot harvesting, paid ballot harvesting and all of that, and uh, also uh, the, the crime issue, that, that that is a top priority for him, because as Lieutenant Nungesser said, Danielle, that's killing New Orleans and it's killing too many places in Louisiana, no pun intended. Exactly. Pretty bad. And Chris, thinking about last legislative session, and I know we haven't talked about this before, but I just think about how hard hard fought some of those incremental victories were that we still got crushed by the governor. I'm wondering and hoping that if the committee makeup is is done right, if the committee leadership is done right in both the House and the Senate, and there's the will and the energy to get things done, we could do everything we wanted to do last session and then, you know, two, three times more than that this session if people really have the will to act and if people are voting the way that they campaigned. Absolutely. And I think the difference is going to be renewed force of, of advocacy organizations like our, ours and others in the state who have our, our hand, our eyes on uh, on our leaders and representatives and will be holding them accountable. And obviously the fact that we have a new conservative governor who hopefully and we believe will be uh, pushing items of legislation that, that we that we really, really need. So we're not going to have to worry about either him opposing legislation or certainly vetoing legislation that it is very, very hard fought uh, to be passed. So hopefully it'll pass into law. Yeah. And it'll be so nice to have someone who is actually supportive. Maybe he even, I don't know, talks to the legislature and, and proposes some ideas himself. He's he's done such a great job as attorney general. I bet he has plenty of ideas that he'd like to see brought to the floor and, and voted on. So I'm, I'm just excited about the prospects and and like he and like uh, Senator Klein Peter said, if we don't get it done this time, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Period. End of story. No one to blame but ourselves. There are no excuses, and time, quite frankly, is short. This is a golden opportunity that that we need that we have to seize. Seize the day. Seize the session. But I want to before we close out today, Danielle. Thank you for for always uh, being such a gracious co-host on the State of Freedom. Every time we get together, the time always flies by. Uh, I want to thank our listeners to the State of Freedom for continuing to build our platform across the state by sharing and subscribing our show. It means so much to us and obviously encourage continued support. And how, how can they do that? Yes, by going to freedomstate.us. There's a support page there. We would love it. Just really appreciate it. If you would consider supporting us financially so we can keep this thing sustainable. We love being able to bring the truth to you. We love being able to bring fantastic viewpoints to you, people that you might not have another opportunity to listen to because they don't really get a voice. And we have some really exciting guests in the works. Um, we we won't do spoiler alerts quite yet, but, but please stay tuned and please be sharing because we are getting some, some fantastic guests who will blow your socks off and really just bless you because I think you're just going to be blown away. So freedomstate.us, or um, if you wanted to send a check in the mail, you can do it at PO Box 861, Berg, Louisiana. And don't forget that your support of LACAG also helps to keep things going. Um, it helps us to be able to hold people accountable down at the legislature. It helps us to continue to support people through the races that we just are still, you know, wiping the sleep out of our eyes from many late nights this this past election cycle. Chris, they can they can support LACAG at lacag.org and through the P.O. box. 
Yes, uh, it'd be LACAG, L-A-C-A-G, P.O. Box 64952, Baton Rouge, Louisiana 70896. And I'm giddy with excitement to talk soon about all of the great successes in this election cycle. I mean, I, I'm blown away by the results that, that we achieved with, with the help of many other people. Like I said, the, the, the state house will be even more conservative than it was before. And the complexion of the state Senate, so importantly, is now changing. And that's all because of the support and efforts and hard work of, of groups like ours across the state. So uh, every donation, all the support you provide to LACAG, your membership and your donations help us to continue on the right path path and to hold people accountable for being faithful to you, which is what it's all about. Yes. And I think with January uh, and the and the swearing in of the new legislature, the swearing in of the new administration, we will continue to see it unfold. I mean, we have high expectations for how things are going to shake out, but um, people will really have the opportunity to show their true colors and we will be right here holding them accountable, as you said, Chris. Yes. Before I, we let you go, um, we'd like to mention an opportunity that you may have heard of once or twice, but we have an opportunity for any listener who may already be investing in precious metals or who may be interested in investing in precious metals or even starting a home-based business in that industry. Metal Stacks is a precious metals collector club where you can buy your metals at the best prices on the market, which is actual dealer cost. And you can refer people to Metal Stacks as well for an additional income. So if you're interested in purchasing metals, you can visit metalstacks.com forward slash D Walker. That helps me out. I get the commission. And just just so you know, Metal Stacks retail prices are super competitive. They're beating the big sites. They have no credit card fees and no minimums. And if you're interested in learning about the business aspect of this as well, you can email me directly at danielle at freedomstate.us. Thank you, Danielle, for the time today. We are what we are. Was, this was is episode this, ninety-two. Episode ninety-two. My yeah. gosh, it seems like we just did the first one yesterday. I know. What, In fact, today is our. I don't know. We have to count the number of months, but we started on April twentieth, and today is November twentieth. I think it's nine months. Nine m- short months, and look at the progress. Every seven day. months. Seven oh, months. I can't count. We're not that. We're not the math duo here. <laughs> yes, yes. Together, together, we are not the math gurus. Uh, seven months, and I mean, it's just it blows my mind what we are doing, how we are moving forward each and every day to preserve the state of freedom in Louisiana. Bless you, Chris. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to The State of Freedom. To stay on top of all the calls to action we mentioned today, just check out the show notes for the episode. If you'd like to support the show financially, visit our website at freedomstate.us. If you'd prefer to give by mail, you can send a check to The State of Freedom, LLC, at P.O. Box 861, Berg, Louisiana, 70343. If you own a business in Louisiana and are interested in supporting our show by advertising, please email us at info at freedomstate.us. To get involved with Louisiana Citizen Advocacy Group, visit lacag.org, L-A-C-A-G dot org, or email Chris at chris at lacag.org. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and share it. Give us a five-star rating in the reviews. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.